Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for giving us insight, giving us wisdom into the times in which we are living. And I pray, Father, that we would take seriously the hour in which we are living. This is no joking matter. We're not here just to entertain ourselves and ignore the reality of what is happening. But, Lord, you have given us eyes to see, insight to walk into life with our eyes wide open with clarity, wisdom, and understanding so we can declare the hope that we have in you in the midst of turmoil and despair. And I thank you for the blessing that you have entrusted to us in this. And I pray that you would help us this morning to articulate your will and your way for us to walk. And we ask this established in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Tammy? Tammy is doing quite well. She, through this device, we can FaceTime one another. I can see her face and we can talk back and forth on our phones through Wi-Fi. We don't even have to pay for it. The hotel has free Wi-Fi. Anywhere I go has Wi-Fi. And we can just dial each other up and just like that we can chat. It's pretty amazing. So we got information very quickly. I was able to track with my phone the progress of their airplane. Imagine that. You just type in their, their flight information and it'll show you the airplane going across. Wow. Tells you when it's landing. It's, it's fabulous what you can keep track of. Uh, it's kind, of, it's kind of scary. I could keep track of you like this too, if, if you really wanted wanted me to. <laughs> I can know where you're at. Most people volunteer the information on like Facebook and stuff like that. They'll volunteer the information. They'll check in when they're at a restaurant. They'll check in when they're wherever. They just they'll just give it right over to you. So be careful. Be careful where you say you are and what you're doing. People check on you regularly. Yeah. Uh, just well, it, Sunday is almost over in India, and this morning they had a church in a almost entirely Muslim community, but they are interested in Christianity, so they came out in droves to hear the message uh, this morning. So praise God, Tammy reported on Facebook after it was over that they just had an amazing day of ministry. So praise God, he's on the move. Patty's just been all smiles every single day. She loves the ministry. Food allergies and stuff like that. Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> God will take care of that. Yeah. I haven't even heard not one thing. Although, you can be completely Western the whole time you're there. Especially if you stay in a hotel, which they are. They're staying in a hotel. You don't have to eat any Indian food at all if you don't want. <laughs> you can eat all the American food that they serve up for you because they have a tourism industry that wants to appeal to more Americans coming and spending their money. So if they serve up a good hotel room and a good meal that Americans enjoy, but if you want the real deal, just step right outside the hotel and you can have the real deal. So... Eat them, eat them. Mm -hmm. Did you eat the Indian food? I ate it all. Yep. Was it hot? Yep. <laughs> yep. It was it was spicy. Some things were more spicy than others. They have some bland foods, of course, like rice. If you just want to have bland rice and bread with butter, you can have that and drink hot tea and you can have your complete meal like that if you want. But it's a place of great need. It's spiritually in great need. They have a lot of resources there, but they're spiritually in need. I can just say that. And that team is doing a good work there, so I thank God that they're there doing the work that they're doing. Next couple of days will just be jam-packed with more ministry. Um, it's, it's unbelievable. When they show up in a community to do ministry, we're not talking 100 people. We're talking like hundreds and thousands of people show up to be ministered to and they some of them have to actually not they're not allowed in because there's just no more room for people and you can see people on the outside like crying because they want to get inside to hear the message talk about a hunger and thirst for righteousness that's what's happening and uh, they actually took a picture of a little girl that wasn't allowed in. There was no more room for her and she was on the outside and Tammy got a picture of her crying outside. She really wanted to get in. But there was just no more room. 
Yeah. And Tammy just sent me a picture. <laughs> Pretty amazing. <laughs> but anyway, I texted uh, John the other day. I was watching the news. I, I don't typically tune into your typical news stations. I just want, to, want you to know that about me. I, I don't typically sit down and watch ABC, CBS, NBC. I just typically don't sit down or Fox, CNN. I really don't watch those news networks. I would rather go find news that's happening actually and reported from the countries in which they're happening. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Instead of it running through the filter of, of our media, I'd rather go get it. And sometimes you have to wade through even that because there's also media police in place <laughs> for those countries too. So you, you've got to remember any news you get has already been pre-filtered for you so certain information comes your way. So I flipped on the television the other night. I said, let's just see what, I think it was ABC News. I said, Let, let's just see what they have to say. And for the first 10 minutes, I was telling John, the first 10 minutes was all about Iran and Israel. I said, well, isn't this interesting? It was like they just sat in on our Sunday school class and, and were participating because here was the remark that, that made the evening. A man said, I'm telling you right now, Iran doesn't need nuclear weapons. They can use a terrorist network to get the job done that they want to do. Now, isn't that what we were saying here? And so filtered through whatever filters all of that news media comes to us, I'm saying to you that there's something happening. America is being told something that's very important right now. Iran doesn't necessarily need nuclear weapons because they have a network of terrorism to wipe Israel off the map. They don't need a nuclear weapon to get it done. Now why would that kind of information be coming to us? Why do we need to know that? From a government, from a governmental media standpoint, why would that information be coming to us? I, I don't know. I was wondering when they were talking about the nuclear, them getting the power, and um, they were talking about Israel and the Israeli nuclear power. And I thought to myself, you know, it's like they're, they're getting ready to do all this to bring Israel and then to the It's like. Israelites, they weren't worried. They're not really worried about these guys doing hard because they, you know, they know what's going on. They live with it day to day. And they're blaming Israel for all the bombings and whatever. Somebody's going to fight me out. I'm going to be bombing them too, you know. I try to keep the upper hand anyway. That's not what I wanted to say, but that's what came out. <laughs> I saw posters on the shark. I guess what I was trying to do, they say this, we're all trying to get together. Let me, let me throw another piece in. Are, are you all familiar with uh, Dennis Kucinich? I've heard. Uh, congressman? Mm -hmm. he, he, he was live this week talking about the same issue, Iran and Israel. And his, his filter says this to America. We're tired of war. We don't need to get involved in a war. If Iran wants to be nuclear, who are we to tell them what to do? That's none of our business. We should back away and let Iran become nuclear. That's none of our business. So, what's that all about? Why did that filter to the top of the news this week? Well, what's going on here? I think they're trying to set us up for that. They keep saying that everybody's getting together. All these people are going to get together what is it, at 12 or whatever is going to be getting together. And that's what's, they're trying to put a fear in it. About the middle of the year, we're going to have this war or whatever. But then I keep hearing God saying, there will be old rumors and rumors about wars and whatever. Right. But, but I, I, I want you to understand something. When, when these news items come to the forefront, we're talking about old, old countries. We talked about this last week during our Sunday school class. This is the middle of a family feud. Ishmael and Isaac. And the rest of the world is participating in this in some way or another because we all need the wealth and provisions that are coming out of the Middle East because 
quite, quite frankly, we are an oil-driven society and much of the world envies that and they also want to become an oil-driven society. So what the Middle East has has become a great commodity. Without the invention of the, uh, the engine that uses oil and gas and these sorts of things, there would not be a need for what's underneath the ground. But now there's this great desire and so all of these things are are brought into the family of feud because they have something that the rest of the world needs. So all of a sudden we feel as though we can articulate into the conversation and say what's going to happen and even try to stiff arm people to get what we want out of it. Marty. When uh, Iran gets word across the ocean to us that uh, we don't even need a nuclear weapon. We can we can wipe them off the map, uh, uh, irregardless with our uh, with our terrorism and, and everything. And then when we hear one of our own announcers stating that, uh, uh, who are we to stop them? Let you know they have instilled the fear in us uh, enough that we just want to stand back and uh, you yeah. know. As yeah, it, uh, let's go theology with that for a minute. They call us the big Satan. This is a religious thing for them. They call us the big Satan. And if they have the big Satan on their heels saying, back, look, they're backing up. They're backing up. We've got them in a position where the great Satan is backing up from them. What does that give them? Power. Leverage. Leverage. Motivation. Motivation to do things differently, perhaps. What were you going to say, Joe? Hey, we're aligned with Israel. I finally saw a, a, a poster in somebody's yard that said, we stand with Israel, mm -hmm. which surprised me. But the United States also has exported more petroleum than they've imported in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that there's, now that that word is getting out, there's a lot of people looking at why do we need that? Mm -hmm. Why do we need that oil? And I'm not trying to justify anybody. No, that, that's another part of the conversation. Yeah. We've got a hundred years worth of crude oil right here. Underneath our own dirt. Yeah, so why, why don't we drill, baby, drill? Is that the line? Yeah. <laughs> you've, got, you've got the isolationist political stand, and then you've got the spread it around the world stand. You know, yeah. and. You know, that's like when they were talking about this. Alaska's got enough oil, but we don't need whatever. And then everybody would stand up and say, well, you can't do that because it's bad for the, the birds and it's bad for the weather. I got this for them. They read the Bible. God's going to take care of the birds. But, it, I, but, there but they're, they are right. All, all of this process is, is harmful at some level. Yeah. I mean, when you have a desert around you and nobody lives in the desert, so what? Drill. <laughs> but, but when you drill where people are, that makes all the difference in the world because you have problems. Just, just look around us. We're just, we're just getting into the, the front end of many problems right here in this, this area, just trying to get gas. Right? Did you just say that we have enough oil here? For 100 years is what they're saying, yeah. I mean, maybe they could find 50 years more somewhere in a pocket that we aren't aware of yet. Okay, but They'll start pumping it when the price goes high enough. It's supposed to be $5 a gallon for yeah. gas. Just like uh, Romney said, he said, uh, I'm for the rich, he said. Uh, I, I couldn't believe, I was in shock when I heard him say this on national TV. He said, I, I'm for the rich, he said. The, the, the poor already have enough loopholes uh, in the system for themselves. So. I, I was shocked, I couldn't believe he said it, you know. No, well, I do. Romney. Yeah, I do. Were you going to say something, John? I was just going to say, you know, no matter what happens, our country is a great country. We came in and nearly made the Indians extinct to take this land out because they were savages and they didn't have a piece of paper. So our government just about wiped them out. We moved in and took this land over. Who came in to stop us? Nobody. We did what we wanted. And it's, I mean, God has, God has everything planned out. No matter what everybody says, no matter what everybody does, and I agree with you, but there, there's things written in this Bible that are pointing to the things that are happening right before our very eyes in the news. And that's the whole point of this class. Why are we why are these things important? And one of my questions up here about Syria.
talk to you about them in just a moment. Why should we concern ourselves with this? Because I know a lot of people, when that kind of news comes on, they're just like, I'm watching Friends. <laughs> Forget about this. But to me, I'm saying this is important. What's happening is very important. Don't turn off those news clips, even the ones that are being filtered to you through our media, because they want you to have certain information. That's why the media that comes to you comes to you. They want you to understand something that's happening in our system. You know, it, it's sort of funny. The weapon on security in um, New York, Washington, and the Jewish areas. Uh-huh. So that's like telling us too with all these. You know, that's another thing for us to be aware of because why are they up with helping the security for the synagogues and all of that? So there, like, there's another flag. Yeah, well, what we realized since 9 11 that buildings can be blown up in this country quite simply and so yeah there, there is heightened security around this I heard somebody on TV I don't know which station I was watching but they said that people here think of 9-11 and, but they don't know that every day in this country that there is somebody trying to do something to either out and annihilate us or get into our system to where we will be so afraid we won't do anything. But it's like, uh, he said, I'm telling you something, there's a terroristic threat. He says, and we're stopping them. One, two, three. He said, people don't realize they're happening every day. Mm-hmm. They do. There's lots of threats that have been stopped. There's threats that, that happen. And uh, we're going to talk about Syria in just a moment, but I, I want John to get into a news piece that talks about what we were, were just talking about. Whenever... America begins to back off. What's, what is happening when we begin to back off of Iran, when we begin to back off of our support for Israel, quite frankly? What happens is, is the news piece that John's going to bring forth. So, John, would you, would you go ahead and... Sure. If you want to open, you've, you've heard a lot of stuff here. I don't know if you have commentary. Yeah, I, I, I would just like to share a few things that happened this week. Um, Pastor, when he texted me, um, it was shortly after, I believe, 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock, whatever the news was, 6.30 maybe, and uh, my phone buzzes and I look and it was a text from Pastor talking about what's happening in the Middle East on the news. And uh, I ended up calling him and I said, you know, I was just watching that, but when you text me, I, I, was, I was watching it on the news. I said, that's what they want me to know, what's really happening. And I went downstairs and I jumped on my computer and I was actually on the Jerusalem Post. I went right to the Middle East. I wanted to find out what was happening over there. So what Pastor said that we are being fed information, it's done for a reason. You know, they're giving us this information and they're not shifting us into a Lacey Peterson or an abducted child story or a Nancy Grace fighting with somebody else, all of this melodrama that's on television. <clears throat> so they're preparing us for something. It's the best way I, I can see this coming. They're putting it on the forefront. We saw last week that our Homeland Security, which is a quasi, I won't go there. <laughs> our Homeland Security Division actually stopped the suicide bomber from going into, I believe it was the White House. Um, he was planning on it and they stopped him. It's only a matter of time. They're, they're broadcasting it to us, they're out there they're here. It's only a matter of time. What is the trigger mechanism? And I think we're studying the trigger mechanism. It's the Middle East. We know that. That's where things are happening. But uh, on Thursday, I had the opportunity when I went to work to ride for about 20 minutes with my boss. And we were going to pick up a car. So she was transporting me to pick up a car. And we weren't in the car for three minutes. And folks, I'm telling you, this is going to be happening. She said, I wonder what's happening in the Middle East. What, what's going on? What this battle's all about? I said, do you really want to know? <clears throat> and she looked at me and she said, yeah. I said, it's a family feud. And I went right back to what we had discussed on Sunday. And by the time she dropped me off, she said, how do you know these things? I said, it comes right out of the Bible. That's where it comes from. I said, it's just playing out today. She 
said some of those fables are so good. Fables? Fables. Okay. You guys the other day, but I haven't, I can't find it, but we did it down south where it's called the Family Feud. Mm-hmm. And it comes down and it has Abraham, and then it has Isaac on one side, and it has Ishmael on the other, and then it goes down their genealogy, and the what's happening, and who's going to be there. Sure. And everything else. I can't find that thing in my phone. But it was, it's there. I read it, and I participated in doing it. I can't remember half of it, but I have to go back and read, and I'm getting old. I have to create things. But uh, it's like a, it, it really was. That was called the family feud. Absolutely. The family feud. Absolutely. Was and I explained to her about the children of Abraham and how that whole separation came, and and walked right on down through today. And you know, the best I left was a big seed was dropped into her spirit. And when things go bad, as they are going to go bad, she is going to know, and people are, around you are going to know that you have answers. Whether they want to ask them now or not, it's not your call. But they're going to have these questions that are coming to you, and you are being prepared for that. That's why we're teaching this. I know it's being led by the Spirit. Mm-hmm. The second thing that happened was, or third thing that happened this week, was I was down in Dixon City, and I was looking at this huge building this fellow owns, and he wants to put in some solid fuel heating. Now, he'd probably just put in, I'm going to guess, fifteen to $20,000 worth of conventional heating systems running on oil and gas, but he wanted solid fuel. And he runs a very successful business that deals with coins and gold and exchanging silver. High energy guy. I spoke with him, we spent about an hour together, and I said, let me ask you a question. Can we step aside from this? Why, do you, why are you looking towards burning coal? Why are you looking towards a, a, a cook stove in your home that you can burn wood and, and heat with? He says, well, he says, I, I, I just want it in case. I said, let me ask you, are you at Doomsday? Are you at 2012, December 21st? He goes, no, 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 I don't believe in that. I said, then, then why are you doing this? He says, I don't know about all that stuff. He says, but I know the U.S. economy and I know the dollar. And he says, it's about to tank. So thank you. You answered my question. They know. The people around you know something's not right. Relatives are staying with me over the weekend. My brother-in-law and sister. They lost $100,000 in the stock market in one quarter. Gone. Just click. Boom. Gone. Gone. And slowly but surely, the house is starting to fall. And when it comes down, it's going to come down very quickly. We know that from Scripture. So we are a prophetic voice in this world Mm -hmm. that's spinning out of control. That's right. I want to read to you an article that came out this week in the Jewish World Review. This is a newspaper and a... um, author or a reporter that reports on things that are happening in the Middle East. You did not see this on Fox News. You did not see this on CBS. You did not see this in the secular news because they didn't want to feed it to you. Let me just read this to you. It deals with the United States as well as Israel. It says, On Monday afternoon, the Palestinians destroyed officially whatever was left of the concept of a peace process with Israel. Anybody see that in the news? Watch. When the Palestinian Authority chairman and the Fatah leader Abbas signed a deal with Hamas, the terror master in Qatar, the notion that there is a significant segment of Palestinian society that is not committed to the destruction of Israel was finally and truly sunk. Both the Obama administration and the European Union claim that the agreement is an internal Palestinian issue. The European Union actually welcomed the deal. As Foreign Policy Commissioner Catherine Ashton's spokesman put it, the European Union has consistently called for intra, that's inside of, Palestinian reconciliation behind President Abbas as an important element for the unity of the future Palestinian state. 
and for reaching a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. The Israeli left, in other words, like the liberal left of, of, of Israel, was quick to blame the agreement on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In an apparent bid to inject a bit of reality into the delusional discourse, Netanyahu condemned the pact. As he put it, quote, if Abbas moves to implement what was signed today, he will abandon the path of peace and join forces with the enemies of peace. Netanyahu added a personal appeal to his supposed partner in peace, saying, President Abbas, you can't have it both ways. It's either a pact with Hamas or peace with Israel. It's one or the other. Netanyahu's statement was a nice start, but it didn't go nearly far enough. In speaking as he did, Netanyahu obscured the fact that Abbas already made its choice. He has cast his lot in that of Fatah with Hamas. In doing so, Abbas once more exposed a dirty secret that everyone knows but no one likes to discuss. Fatah and Hamas share the same strategic goal of destroying Israel. One seemed to have this peace path, the other was terrorism. But now the peaceful side, if you will, has now joined with Hamas. Why are they taking this change? Why are they moving to the, to the right? to the hard line, to de destroy Israel's side instead of a peaceful coexistence. Let me ask you a question. It goes back many, many administrations in the United States government. Have we not tried to bring in a peace accord in the Middle East? And we saw the Middle East, certain factions of the Palestinians, working with the United States and Camp David meetings and everybody trying to get together and singing Kumbaya, we can get along, right? Well, were they really ever after peace, do you believe? No. So what was happening? Why were they appeasing the United States, do you believe? If their total ideology was to go after and destroy Israel, the enemy, the, the occupiers, if you will, that, that should never have been, been brought back in in 1948, if they're saying, well, let's do this in a peaceful way, why were they doing that? Do you have an idea? Should keep us out of their mm -hmm. Keep us happy so we don't go and investigate much, really. They're trying to keep the great Satan trying to appease us and keep us at arm's length in the Middle East. Watch this. Fatah is not a moderate force that accepts a peaceful resolution of the Palestinian conflict with Israel. It is a terrorist organization and a political warfare organization. And Fatah's strategic goal remains what it has been since it was founded in 1959, the obliteration of the Jewish state. In truth, Monday's agreement is nothing new. Fatah, which was the peaceful side, if you will, and Hamas, the terrorist side, have worked together since at least 1994. In November 1994, Hamas and Fatah signed an agreement in Cairo. The agreement set out each other's sphere of responsibility. Fatah would negotiate with Israel and Hamas would attack Israel. That Cairo agreement was but the first in a line of agreements between the two groups. Each new agreement in turn reflected both their shared goal of destroying Israel and their changing tactical preferences. With the Muslim brothers taking power in Egypt now, both men are far more powerful today than they ever were before. Moreover, Marshall's transitional power sharing agreement with Abbas is remarkably similar to the deal the Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood brought with Egypt's military junta in the lead up to recent elections. In other words, there's a whole change going on and Hamas is part of that change. The Muslim Brotherhood is part of that change. 
Up until recently, Egypt had signed a peace agreement with Israel. That's about to go on. The most troubling aspect, here we come to the United States, the most troubling aspect of Abbas's decision to turn to Hamas at this moment of weakness is what it says about the relative balance of regional forces. Twenty years ago, when Yasser Arafat was weakened and isolated due to Israel's defeat of the Palestinian uprising and Arafat's decision to support Saddam Hussein against the U.S. in the Gulf War, the PLO, Arafat, decided that the only way to rebuild his strength, because he was beaten down, was to gain recognition from the United States. And 20 years ago, Arafat knew that the road to Washington went through Jerusalem. So he agreed to enter into peace talks with Israel. He never wanted peace. He wanted to rebuild. In its testament to the weakened state, get this folks, if you haven't heard anything else, hear this. In its testament to the weakened state of the U.S. in the region that in this hour of distress, Abbas opted to turn to Hamas. Abbas says, we're not going to deal with Washington anymore. We're going to really now pull up our flag for what we really stand for, and that is the destruction of Israel, and we are going to team up with Hamas. Not only does this signify that Washington is no longer considered a serious power broker, it indicates that for weakened leaders, peace with Israel is a far less attractive option than peace with a jihadist. Like Abbas, Arafat was a liar. The consequence of Arafat's move towards Washington was a two-decade-long phony peace process that left Israel in a strategic position far weaker than it ever enjoyed in 1992. The consequences of Abbas's move towards Hamas will in all likelihood be far worse. They are now dismissing the power and the authority of the United States government, saying we are now going to do exactly what we wanted to do from the start. We're going after Israel as a group. Because they know we won't do anything. But why is this important? Why is this being told to us? Why, why is this even coming out in this room right now as a piece of news? What, what should we understand? I think we need to understand that if we no longer stand alongside of Israel, that we will not receive the blessings of God any longer. Well, yeah, there, there's two pieces to this, really. Um, Psalm 83.4, you can go there if you'd like. Psalm 83.4, piece of prophecy that we've already discussed at length. But this prophecy is coming together in our time. Whenever, fundamentally, when people ask you about the news, what's going on in Israel, why is, why is America backing off? Or you could inject that into the conversation. Do you know America is really backing off and there, there's two groups, Hamas and Fatah, they're, go, they're coming together. One was a peaceful organization, one was a terrorist organization. And uh, they, both, they both were trying to work at one angle to get rid of Israel. So Psalm 83.4 says... They have said, come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. Now if you remember a man by the name of Hitler, he, he tried to do this. Was he successful? No. no he, he disbanded them and, and moved them and killed many Jewish people, but he did not succeed in wiping them off the map. Um, we were part of an alliance that put that to a stop. Right? Our country was part of that whole process. Let's put this monster to a stop. He's not going to continue this process any longer. So we were, we were all about that. Our country was all about putting a stop to the existential threat of Israel. That was a point in history. That was a dot on the line. But here we are, 2012, and all of a sudden, our policies have changed. They... Israel had an alliance with the United States. And we said that we would stand with them. But we have seen that become a weary problem for us. Why? Because many Americans have seen our own soldiers lost 
in the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iraq, all of these things. And we have become so weary of war as a country, our deficit and our budget cuts are demanding that we cut back in the military, and all of a sudden we have no interest in fighting one more war. And then you have a congressman getting on the news and saying, you know what, let them be. We've got our own problems. And as we back off, who gets a big smile on their face? <laughs> Even the Arab right. Those people that want Psalm 83.4 to become a reality, come and let us cry, cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. And what I'm trying to say to you in this room is as you read this scripture and as you're watching the news, these things are becoming a cold reality right before our very eyes. That as we back up, we are exposing them to a threat, an existential threat of this Kali, um, a conspiracy of nations that are coming against Israel. And we are watching it happen. And we're watching it happen in news pieces like he said. This group is coming together. This group is coming together. This group is coming together. Someone says, hey, you know what? That threat of, of Iran, you don't have to, have to even worry about them. There's, they have enough influence with all of these other groups around the world that have a terroristic uh, bent towards destroying Israel. Iran can call the shots from a theological standpoint and still wipe Israel off the map without ever lifting a finger to get it done. And that points to what John was saying last week. If you look at the, the nations that were lining up in Psalm 83.4, they didn't actually include Iran. But Iran is a, a piece of the puzzle that's talking in the background to make it all happen. Because they also agree with Psalm 83.4. Let's wipe Israel off the map. And so you say, wow, this, this is actually happening right before our very eyes. And try if you want. Call your congressman. I don't think you're going to get anywhere. These things are happening. They've already been set into motion. You, you can't stop them by politicking. Our, our politicians are, are allowing news pieces to rise and get into your spirit so you can start to agree with it and say, yeah, we're tired of war. We have no business being over there. Why don't we just tend to our own problems? You know what? Gas is going up to five bucks a gallon, they're predicting. Why is that news information getting to you when it's only at 359? Why are they telling you gas is going to five? What, what are they prepping you for? They're prepping you for mid-June if Israel does have a preemptive strike. You know what's going to happen automatically. There's going to be a spike. So they're already creating in you animosity towards the price of gas going up, which in reality has to do with all of this. The news that we're talking about today. So as long as Americans are happy about the price of gas, then things are well. But if they get you upset enough, then they can get you to agree, let's just back off. Let's just back up. Let's, let's just deal with our own problems here in America. And then we become a non-issue in the Middle East. A non-issue. It's like we've always went to First World War, Second World War, when it seemed like they were fighting and not getting anywhere. Called the good old went over and we lost men, but we also seem to be the conquering force. But today, we are so far away from God, most of us, that he's letting us understand, okay, you went over there, and now you're going to depend on me. You know, if you don't get on your knees and pray and get this country back to where it's supposed to be, and quit listening to these Virginia, what I'm trying to tell you is our country is where it's supposed to be. The, the, the Bible is moving us right out of the way so that these things can come to pass. We are right where we're supposed to be. Everybody thinks we have to do things differently to change, but 
But like you just said, this is right, if you read the Bible, that's where we're supposed to be. Yep, we're... If things are taking place just like they're supposed to. And, and you're right. Go ahead, John. I was, I was listening to, I was listening to, I was watching a Christian station this morning, and it was a prophetic voice on there. And you probably will not identify his name as a prophetic voice, but it's Pastor Meadowlark Lemon. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Remember the Harvard Globetrotters? Yeah. This guy is an on, on fire pastor for God. And he's speaking prophetically. And he stopped and he says, let me, let me point a finger to all you athletes out there, all of you in the NBA, all of you in NFL, all of you in, in professional sports that are making you millions of dollars. He said, it's coming down, it's coming down fast. You're going to have nothing at the end of this. He said, if you don't grab onto Christ, you're going to have nothing at the end of this. Yeah. I'm like, yes! It's true. <laughs> it's true. I've been watching. Uh, sometimes I'll tune into sports, and I, I'm particularly interested in how many people are in the stands. And you're seeing more and more empty seats right. at the events. And I thought, it's starting to come down. And they're demanding more money. You'll see the athletes are demanding more money. That's what the NFL strike was all about. And you watch that in the NBA strike happen. You watch it happen then. They're trying to grab at all the money now and get a nice extended contract for 10, 15 years that they can work on. But if the fans don't come in and pay the price, nobody gets their money. And it's already starting to happen. Next Sunday is the Daytona 500. You can still get tickets. That never happened in the past. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess, I don't know what I'm asking, but I get it. In a way, I'm going, all right, we're going to be out of the way. I know God does. Mm -hmm. But what's going to happen to us? But this is where, I, I know that this runs hard against what we are. We are patriotic people. In God we trust. We are Americans. No one can come against us. We've been all brought up that way. But this is a time, and this you're going to crucify me for this. <laughs> this is time to let go of your American patriotism and hang on to the kingdom of God because that's all we've got. But there are still people within the kingdom of God trying to hang on to American values. And at some point, it's like there's an old toy, Stretch Armstrong. He used to pull him, you know. <laughs> He's made out of like this gooey material. I know because I, I sliced them open and found out what was inside. But <laughs> you could stretch this guy. And eventually, there was a point you couldn't stretch him anymore. And as long as American Christianity still tries to hang on to American patriotism, we're going to stretch to a point where you can't stretch anymore and you're going to have to let go of one or the other. Some people will let go of the kingdom of God and go purely this direction and some people will hang on to the kingdom of God and let go of all of that. Because at some point it breaks. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with American patriotism because our values were set on right. That's right. these things. Right. But, uh, but America is not that America any longer. But the, I keep thinking of all the people that do believe in Christ and are Christians in America. Mm -hmm. I think we're the most God-fearing nation there is. Right, but it's time to come back to God-fearing book of Acts, preach that gospel, and let go and say, you know what, let's pursue what God wants. We don't care. As a nation. No, as a nation. Mm -hmm. I agree with you. There's something else I wonder about. You said that you know that we're right where God wants us. God is telling us what is going to happen because He foresees the beginning and the end. Uh -huh. God didn't want us to people to turn against Israel. I don't. Think. No, but but there, if if you read the prophecies of this book, there is no great Superman that sweeps in from the west no. and rescues. No. In a moment, the, the prophecy is that, that God will do this work. God will be the savior of the moment just like he was in 1967, 1972 against all odds. Go all the way back into the Bible. Gideon against the Midianites. Un unforeseeable odds and yet they were still victorious. There's a movie out there called Against All Odds yeah. and they're going through this minefield yeah. and they double up a good wind comes along and goes yeah. God comes along, blows the wind, it takes oh, and reveals the all the. Shows the mind where the guy from Israel can blow. Yeah, here they are. That's, that's cool. There, there are two things. Um, April 2009, what they call the BRIC nation, Brazil, India, Russia, and China, and now they're adding South Africa to it. 
petition to have the U.S. dollar removed as reserve currency for the planet. That's right. If that happens, our entire financial system is virtually impotent. There's nothing. And that's part of, in my mind, a, a, a global agenda to neuter the United States. And is America in the Bible anywhere? Well, some people would say there's mention of it, but I mean, I, I, I tend to. The United States coming to save Israel in the end time. No. There's no, nothing. I'm not we're not. No, I'm not saying we should look on the street. Yeah, Jesus said right. Israel will be hated by all nations. Yeah. So that would include our nation. All so it, it's not the intent of God. It's just the prognosticator God that says, "Guess what? Yep. All nations will hate Israel for my name's sake." And that will include us. And we are watching our leaders before our very eyes. Uh, Kucinich is the latest voice. You could find many other voices that have said the same thing. But he is the latest voice just this week saying, you know what, we need to back off. So you're saying that basically what they're trying to do is harbor an anti-Israel sentiment in the United States so that we too can hate Israel and say they drag us into it. I think so. I mean, that's, okay. that's I, just... I, that's, that's just how my mind connects dots, but yeah. Trust in God. I don't think that I can't. I can't be myself hate Israel. No, that, when you're an individual that stands with the kingdom of God, you're going to read your Bible and it says, "Pray for the peace of Israel," and you're going to act on that. You're not going to have an anti-Semitic view. You're going to have a strong God-centered view that loves God's people. And even these people, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, we should love these people because they also need Christ. When they find, when they find their families dead in the streets, they cry too. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. That's right. But our leaders are not projecting what we believe. No, but they are our elected officials. And, and still, this goes back to what a democracy is. They, they represent. And this is what happens in the news. When they speak, they think around the world that they are speaking the views of all Americans. Because we live in a democracy and our leaders are supposed to speak for the people. So if we elect them and put them into office and they, they get on a microphone and start rattling these things off, these these nations that are terrorists start to get that information and they say, huh, that's what America thinks. And they, they get a big smile on their face. Finally, there's a breakthrough here. We can actually push the, the big Satan back and we can get our agenda accomplished. Psalm 83, 4. And I'm saying, hold on to your hats. It's happening at a rapid pace. Yeah, he drew some stuff up yeah, there. You, you said that... Uh, ago that you were going to be crucified for what you said. Well, I'll be crucified on the right side. Okay, remember me when you get me. <laughs> God, I was sitting here before and God drew my attention to something in this church that I never look at and I never see in years. Second Chronicles 7.14. And he just drew my attention to it and then the discussion went on. And then it ran in a circle and now I know why. Here we go. Get ready. <laughs> 2 Chronicles 7.14, many of you know it. God says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. How many of you have heard that before? And how many of you have said, God, this is your word. If we as a church get together, you're going to heal America. Anybody ever prayed that? Everybody thought that. That is not for us. That is for the Jews. That is for God's people. We are the church. We are not Israel. We are not the 12 tribes. That was for His people, His promise to those people in that land of milk and honey. They were rebellious. They were going their own way. God says, if you will do this, I will restore you. I will heal your land. 
that, that you, actually that actually comes into context when when Solomon was asking for wisdom. Mm-hmm. This this scripture comes into context here. God says, I'm going to give you this wisdom and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Exactly. Your people are going to follow me, but then they're going to rebel against me. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, then I will heal their land. It was a conversation that God was having with Solomon about what his people were about to do. So talk about ripping scriptures out of context. This was a definitive conversation exactly. between God and Solomon concerning the nation of Israel. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's great. And we have taken it and we said, well, we can apply the same thing to us. We can't. It wasn't for us. We live by a different covenant, a different set of promises, because we are the church, which is the body of Christ, correct? We inherit a different promise. We belong to a heavenly kingdom and we are ambassadors for that kingdom. We are going through this land of America, which is where we're born. Praise God we were. Mm-hmm. born here. It's a blessing to be born here instead of North Korea or China or Russia Okay, and many other nations in Africa. We're blessed to be here and we become patriotic because it is such a great country. But this was never a nation of Christians. This was never a Christian nation. It was founded on Christian principles with a lot of Christians here. But what has happened to it? The whole thing has fallen apart. So if we were to pray that, Christians throughout the world would be trying to heal the whole world. This is my land. This is my land. This is my land. I live over here. I live in India. This is my land. God said, no, that wasn't for you. You come from a heavenly kingdom and you're ambassadors. You represent my kingdom in that foreign land that you are occupying right now. You are strangers. Yeah. What, what, what John is saying is we don't establish governments here. We establish the principle that God's people all over this earth are lost and we're gathering them into him in Christ. We are now on assignment. We are not pilgrims looking for a place to land. We are pilgrims on a, a journey trying to reach people for the cause of Christ. And, and we, sometimes we are more American or more German or more Czech or more Portuguese or whatever. You're, you're more national than you are kingdom. And, and what we are trying to say is get out of your nationalism and become a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And when you do that, you'll be on assignment. Are we making sense? Yeah. You're holding the word of God in your hand and you will always be a stranger because guess what? True. You're not from here. You're from another place, the kingdom of God. So when you watch the news, understand that this is our position. We are seated at the right hand of Christ in heavenly places, correct? We know that from Ephesians in our study. That's our home. That's where we are from. So when we see the news, understand that that is affecting the Babylonian system. If we're looking to the Babylonian system for our prosperity and our peace and our safety and our security, you are going to be in fear. Mm Mm-hmm. If we look to God, our Heavenly Father, who supplies all our needs, supplies all our, our wants, all, everything that we need to carry on this mandate as ambassadors, then we have nothing to fear. Very least from man. That's right. I didn't have a bad history because we were going home. Now, my daughter says, I said, come on over there. It's cheaper gas. Come on over there. And she goes, Mom, you got to have a tank. I said, yeah, but tomorrow it may be $4. <laughs> and as long as I'm hanging on the cross, I'm going to tell you that I am not a Republican, I am not a Democrat, I am not an Independent, I am an ambassador. God, that makes sense. It's true. You can do your research. Find out. Somebody this week, you report back to us, find out when the religious right got invited into the political scene. Because we weren't always there. Find out when it happened. And report back to us. I'm going to do my homework too. But you find out when it happened. That's kind of like your homework assignment. Find out when what is called the political right got involved in politics and became influential. That was the church's invitation into the persuasion of politics. Are you going back to the 1770s? You find out. <laughs> you find out when it would happen because it's not always been. It hasn't been the entire length of our country's history. It hasn't been. I'll give you a hint. All leads road. All roads lead to it. Say it again, John. All roads will lead to it. I. This is tough. It's tough to talk like this because I grew up in the same country you did, 
I, July 4th, like, that's a cool holiday to me, watching the fireworks and putting an American flag shirt on and, and just saying, yeah, we live in a great country. And it, it's nice. And what we all hearken back to is Constitution. We always talk about the Constitution on July 4th, uh, the Declaration of Independence, and all of these wonderful documents that are, that are on storage for us to always look back to, but we're not that country anymore. I, something has dramatically shifted that we're not that same values any longer. Look, Pastor, I keep telling my kids, people die to get in this country. Mm -hmm. Because we have so much more freedom than they do other countries. How, how, however, I will share with you this. Those <laughs> French students that come and visit, they are very opinionated about America. Although they would like to come and see New York City, Hollywood, and all of the stuff that our country has to offer, they're very opinionated about our government. They're very opinionated about how we conduct ourselves. And, and it affects their exchange of money whenever they come to this country and, and all of these things. And they're very concerned and they're very opinionated about how we conduct ourselves in the world. And you say, like, who are you? <laughs> Tell us how to do things. I, we still we still have the grocery stores that have all the choices that you want. We still have all the restaurants with all the choices that you want. Albeit, some of them are beginning to shut down. If you notice your little journey through here down to Scranton, you'll start to notice some things are starting to close their doors. Well, like somebody said to me, you know, I'm going down and I'm going to buy me one of those new hybrids. Because then I won't have to worry about it yet. I got new points. Instead of going to have to go and electricity. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's a... A stupid argument. <laughs> you have to plug in. The, 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 the basis for electricity is coal. <laughs> it's mindless. It's mindless. If you plug in or you pump, it doesn't matter. You're paying, this. You're paying the piper. Trust me. Grow some corn, make some moonshine, fill your gas tank, and get going. <laughs> yeah using our corn for fuel so we're going to be going hungry. Of course we are because we all live off of corn. Well, I'm but, the Lord is going to feed me one way or another. But don't I'm going to get a lot skinnier than I <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we, we need to stop here. Any, any last words? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this discussion. I thank you that you are honing in our vision upon your kingdom. And I pray, Father, that we would live as your ambassadors as John has pointed out here this morning that that is what we are if we are a part of you and live according to your divine will that we don't have to live in fear but we can see the times in which we are living we don't need to react we just need to live in accordance with your divine will and plan and I pray that we would be your servants willing to do such things in these times and we ask this accomplished in Jesus name Amen Alright let's take a short break and we'll get back together in just a moment Yeah I was